purpose. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Transformed. Be ye transformed. Be changed. Don't live in the old way. Take your stinking thinking and throw it out and accept what God says to be true. A lot of what he says and how to behave goes strictly against what you're taught. All your natural instincts. But you know what? Your natural instincts are a result of the sin that's in the earth. And because they're the result of the sin in the earth, then they don't need them because they keep you from God. They keep you from who you really are and who you were created to be. Transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means get rid of those thoughts. Replace them. Replace them with what? Replace them with what God says. You do that and your mind will be renewed and then things will change. Love of money is the motivating God of the ungodly. Hmm. Love of money, the motivating God of the ungodly, uses kings, politicians, lusting desire, and money to control, to control for the gain of influence and wealth in a world-based system. In other words, it's the love of money that says, if we do this to the soil, we'll get more kernels of corn. But it damages the soil. That's okay. It, we can continue to do this and get more kernels of corn. But it's not healthy. That's okay. We can still do this to get more kernels of corn. And the more corn we get, the more money we make. We're looking for a cure for this disease. We want your money to do it. But isn't there a man that's already done that? Aren't there people that say this is a, a better way? Who's checking into this? Well, we're working with the pharmaceutical companies, and we want money. And those other ways just don't work. How do you know they don't work? Oh, they don't work. It's not worth the effort to prove it. All about money. Genetically modified grains, which are not as healthy as they should be. It's all about money. Pharmaceuticals, money. The grain industry, money. Pesticides, they're sprayed on plants, money. It's all about money. Yeah, steroids, antibiotics, all kinds of things to make sure that they get increased production to make money stuff in your water to kill those certain bugs, but in the long run, it can hurt you. It's all about money. But we have all of these people who are out there saying all this stuff is good, talking about the entertainment industry. Well, it's good. It's not a problem. It's, it's good. It's not a problem. But the the good guys. You watch them, and according to God's word, you see sin after sin after sin being committed. You have all this bombarding on you that says the world is normal, the world is good. Isn't there a scripture that says the, the ways of a man may seem good to him, but the end thereof is death? Yeah, there is. So here... We have money, we have all this entertainment. And I, I'm, what, uh, 60, 68 now? And I, I remember the very small black and white TVs when they first came out. I remember Groucho Marx for making a suggestive comment to a lady on his program. 
being suspended for a week. I remember, leave it to Beaver, I remember all these things. And the only, now the only time, if you really turn our classic movies, you can find some neat little movies there, which aren't too bad. Although even some of those you've got to watch to make sure that you stay reasonable. But when movies like Shawshank Redemption, I'm stepping on people's toes now, and that's okay. Because he was a good, an honest man who committed no crime and went to jail, but he didn't prosper until he broke the law and escaped, and then he prospered greatly. And his other buddy in prison did the same thing. The books Harry Potter teach a child that unless you lie and cheat and think that adults are stupid, uh, you're just not with it. You're just as bad as the adults, and the adults are terrible. And there's other things attached to those books. A lot of the Christian community sees no problem with it. Wake up. Read the book and see what they're telling their kids they can do. Watch some of the stupid cartoons on TV that are teaching your kids that you're stupid. You better love your kids. That way you can keep a little bit of control of them. I don't mean control of them to be controlling. I'm talking about control by being an example of a loving, true human being. And to do that, you have to have the spirit of the living God in you. Otherwise, you only think you know what love is. There's a lot of parents that do care for their children. And God uses that to try to draw them, uses those children to try to draw that parent to him. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace. Well, I need to stay with it here. Yeah. Okay, conform to the will of the money, might. I say all this to say that there's a lot of things come together to try to teach you that sin is okay. Try to teach you that the world is okay. Well, if the world was so okay, why are we so concerned about terrorists and terrorism? Because the people of God are no threat that way. The only people that are a threat are ungodly. Because according to the word of God, you're supposed to love people. And being destructive to them, I can't see that as loving. Might doesn't make right. You know, I remember as a kid, you know, We'd have a discussion about something and about, and you know you're correct on what you're telling the group, yet you're one out of six that have that viewpoint, and they all get upset with you and demand that they're correct. Well, there's five of us and only one of you. We're right. If it's not true, it's not true. And just because so many of you agree doesn't make it true. If it's not true, it's not true church needs to wake up to that. The love of God makes right. The power of God ensures that right always prevails. Always prevails. Right and righteousness are the same. Ecclesiastes 5.8 If thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, Marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. You need to understand what this is saying. It says, when the oppression is there, the judgment and the justice is destroyed. The word marvel not means fear not. It comes from words that really say, uh, not to be in consternation, 
agitation or dismay, but it means to fear not. So God's saying it when all this stuff goes wrong, fear not. We're in a place right now that people need to be saying, fear not. We need to say, fear not. For he that is higher than the highest regardeth. For he, let me read that a little differently. For he that is God, than all these people who are judging. And he regards. He sees it. He knows it. And there will be mightier than they. He will be mightier than they. All this perversion and all this perversion of justice and all this oppression of the people, God knows all about it. He's going to take care of his own. He's going to take care of us. Ecclesiastes 5.8. Now there's some examples of some people that are important to understand, and King David is one of the best. In Psalms 18, starting at verse 2, he says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Right there it states that my saving from my enemies depends on my calling upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord and I will be saved. What happens if you don't call upon the Lord? You're up for grabs. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men make me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death perverted me, or correction, prevented me. In my distress, I call upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Takes it personal. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also the hills moved and were shaken. Because he was wroth. Because this man cried out to God in his oppression, God was angry. Not at him. You also need to understand that he lived it. In 1 Samuel chapter 26, starting with verse 22, And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear. Now you need to understand at this point, David was being pursued by Saul. And this happened several times, and, and God put David in a place where he had control of Saul's life. But David never killed him, which is what his friends around him wanted him to do. Kill him, be king, because he'd been anointed to be king. But that's not what David did, and it's a good thing. Because had he done that, he probably would have been cut short. Anyway, and David answered and said, Behold the king's spear. And let one of the young men come over and fetch it. After he took his spear in the middle of the night, the next morning he went to the king and said, Here's, You recognize this? This is your spear. Send one of your men over here to get it. Because if he was close enough to get the spear, he was close enough to cut the throat. Now this is interesting. The Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today. But I would not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. God put him in that position. It wasn't up to David to remove him. And behold, I like this, as thy life were much set, by this day in mine eyes. What's it mean? As thy life was much set. It means I respected your life. I considered your life. By this day in my eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord. Not Saul. Lord. He didn't rely on Saul. He relies on the Lord. 
So because I set my eye on you and held you properly, I'm asking the Lord to do the same for me. And let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Him being the Lord. Psalms 31.1. That, that was David's heart. What I just read was David's heart. You've been living out in the wilderness like a criminal for a long period of time, and you get your one enemy in your hand. How many people would want to kill him? Well, he had his enemy three times, and he never did it. Psalms 31.1, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thy ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock, for an house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. I mean, you can't read this and spend time looking at it and understand it to realize that he's saying God gets me out of this stuff. I'm submitted to him. I commit my spirit. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Do with me what you will. The root of their trust and hope is a biblical hope. Is God. Their hope is in God. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting with verse 9, we, run in, we have a lady here, we're dealing with Hannah. So let me read it, start in verse 9. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now, they were there for a feast. Hannah was barren. Her husband had no children by her, but had several by his other wife. And Hannah, what, to them, in their culture, it was extremely important to, to give your husband children. And she wanted desperately to have children for her husband. But she had been barren. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after that they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. Eli is the head priest. Verse 10. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. This woman was upset. She went to the temple and she prayed. Jumping down to verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 1, 13. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. She is so grieved that she's praying and her mouth moves, but her voice wasn't heard. That means when you whisper, you hear your own voice. This is the only place I know of that silent prayer is clearly stated and answered in Scripture. It's the only place I know of. But she didn't hear it. If it's not heard, when we whisper, we hear our own voice. I'm telling you, she was in the deep part of prayer. She was committed. It wasn't in her flesh. It was in her heart. Thought she had been drunken. Verse 16. After he accuses her. Then she says, Count not thy handmaiden for a daughter of Baal. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaiden find grace in thy sight. So the woman went away and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. She wanted a child, that's what she was praying for. 
when she got there. She had a need that she wanted met, and it was a critically important need to her. So she went to where she knew she would find God, and in that time, the place to find God was in the temple. Eli was in the office of the chief priest. So when Eli spoke, she knew that Eli spoke as the representative representative of the God of that temple. After he spoke in agreement, she received it. It was done. That's why she was able to get up, go eat, no more sad. But she knew she had her answer. Church, if you got a problem, you need to know where your God's supposed to be found. In your prayer closet, in your prayer. But you also need to know where you find your shepherd. Because that shepherd's the one who leads you to still waters and green pastures. That shepherd, your pastor, or who's ever your leader in your church and congregation, that's the individual who has a unique anointing like Eli did to come into agreement with you because God says to submit to the elders. First Peter. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil's seeking you to devour you. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. The Lord took me to this particular area years ago. I was praying about some things and uh, I had a vision. I was asking him some questions about what to do next. And what I saw, I saw a man's huge fist. And on the wrist, right behind this huge fist, it was this little bitty watch. This little watch. That's all I saw. It disappeared and I said, Okay, Lord, I saw that. What's it mean? So I laid there in my quiet place for a while. No answer. So I got up and I was reading my word. I was reading my word and I stumbled. And I, I didn't stumble. I was led to. First Peter... Chapter 5. And then I hit verse 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. The fist represented the mighty hand of God, the hand of power, the hand of his glory. And to fit this vision, he had a watch on. Because he's keeping track of the time. When it's right, it comes. But you also, the, the thing it said, in verse 9 it says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The stuff you're going through is a brand new, born again child of king. It's been my experience that when someone gets saved, immediately something gets their attention by being wonderful, and it's a gift of God, and it's a blessing, and they're delivered or healed or something of something. And it's like God saying, okay, got your attention? This blessing's granted. Then you say, well, okay. Then you realize you still have other problems. Why didn't I get fixed of all of them? All at once, boom. Why aren't I just 100%? Why not? That's not bad. I don't think it's because he didn't ask. 
But he says, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You just came out of the world. Part of the worldly afflictions still hang on to you. And God delivers you out of those. Now, I ask him, so well, why is that? I got a couple of different answers on that, and I believe both are appropriate. It's kind of like when a person spends 30 years telling them they don't need me, you think that two minutes is going to really prove to me that they're sincere and that they're going to hang on? They need to go through a process. So they're, otherwise they may think that everything's fine and don't need me anymore. And go back to their vomit. The other thing is that he says, when you become a brand new born again child of the king, you a babe. You don't have the knowledge and the wisdom to deal with everything. So as you're walking with Christ, with those who are around you to mentor you and to raise you up in Christ and to train you and teach you and to give you wisdom, then you start bumping into all this stuff that needs to change in your life. And because there's there, you make decisions to change them. You make decisions to submit yourself to the Word of God. It's like Peter after he denied Christ three times. How many times did Christ ask him, do you love me? It was three times, wasn't it? Yeah. Peter, do you love me? You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You've got to believe in him. You've got to know who he is, and you've got to seek him. Does that mean you earn anything? No. I mean, everything's by mercy and grace. But why do you have to seek him? He wants a relationship with you. If you just get married to someone you've never known, and then you never spend time with that person, what kind of a relationship is that? It isn't. And God wants relationship. It's all about relationship. And to have relationship with a holy God, you become holy. That which touches the altar is holy. God still has an altar. You become holy. You're holy because he says you are, not because you've earned it. You're holy because he's cleaned you, not because you've washed yourself. You're holy because that's his plan. That's his purpose for you. And if you're going to be a kid of his, he's holy. So you're going to be like your dad. Dad's holy. I'm holy, because he made it so. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Can you imagine God saying to a man, Hey, you need to build a big boat. And they're out in the middle of nowhere. Never rained. And there's no sign of the river rising or anything like that because it's just dry. And he's telling me to build a big boat. Well, we know what happened after that. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet not seen as yet, moved with fear, respect, understanding, he knew, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. He saved himself and his household. We have promises when we walk with God for our households. They're in other scriptures, but this is one of them. 
But here's something important. By the which he condemned the world. When Noah was obedient to instruction, he condemned the world. He allowed God to do the work. Because he was saving, God was taking his nucleus, he was moving on with. And it condemned the world. Do you know that every time a Christian does what God's told him to do, he condemns the world. Because that gives that person the opportunity where he can step into what he's been told and participate with it or step into the condemned world and stay there. And there will be witness that they had that opportunity. But that's their choice. That's why we pray for them, hoping that God will open their eyes, open their hearts, open their understanding to truth, that they may hear and be converted. Paul writes, At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God strengthened him, gave him the ability to do what he called him to do. And then in verse 18 it says, The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Now I know you all know we got crucified. Is crucifixion an evil work? So what, what, I mean, come on now, delivered him from every evil work and he got crucified? His crucifixion was not evil from Paul's perspective. The Lord's crucifixion was not evil from Christ's perspective. It's Paul and it's Christ who didn't do the evil work. It was their purpose. So he was delivered from every evil work. He didn't partake of evil works. That also means that just because you were where God wants you, doesn't, it means that just because things are not going well, it doesn't mean that you're in the wrong place. It doesn't mean that you've misunderstood or heard wrong. When they were in the boat and Peter got out of the water, they were where God told them to be, and they had to rock and roll time out there on the water. And then before he got out, they were afraid they were going to sink, be destroyed in the boat. But they were in the place God told them to be. He said, get in the boat, meet me on the other side. So they got in the boat. Then they had this rock and roll time in the boat. And they see the ghost to them, Christ on the water. And then Peter says, call me. And he got out of the boat. Why didn't the other 11? No, he's the one who asked to go. If it be so, call me. The others could have said, yeah, I want to go too. He's the one that got out of the boat. Every evil work, God will carry us through our hard times. God will carry us through our trouble. God will be with us. Peter knew all would die. I knew when he would die. I expect to be live to a ripe old age, unless the Lord tells me different. I expect to be told. Did others? Now I want to say one thing about me. Be. I'm nobody special. Anything that I have done, anyone who hears this can do it. 
I believe part of it's calling. But if you think that I'm just not your average flesh and blood human being that God needed to save and fix and repair, you're terribly wrong. He can use us all. There's no one he can't use. And when it comes to brain power, the Holy Ghost whispers in your ear. The Holy Ghost tells you what you need to know. So if you think, well, my memory's bad, I'm going to tell you, in the natural, my memory has been affected. Because I took a medication because everybody said I ought to. I didn't want it. I figured it wouldn't make any difference. It didn't, except it bothered my memory. I prayed about it. So I'm not really sure what it's all about. It's like when I went to the dentist one time, I get in the chair and I said, Lord, I know you can fix this. I know I prayed about it, but yet here I sit to get this pain gone. Am I failing here? Or is this where you want me to be? What is this? I told the young lady who was about to work on my teeth, I said, I don't know why I'm here. I know I got this problem with the tooth, but I don't know why I'm, not, why I'm here. There must be some reason other than this tooth. Because God can fix it without sending me there. I just, I'm still growing, still learning. I have a great expectation in what God's about to do, and then I'm done. When I command the people of God to wake up and arise, and I do it right now in Jesus' name, wake up and arise. Be who you were created to be. Be who God made you to be. Be attached to God and His Holy Spirit in the way He desires of you. Do what He's called you to do. I declare that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. When you're obedient to the Holy Spirit, things change. Father, I ask that you water this in people's hearts, that you bring forth fruit, that you are totally glorified by it, that you, Father, pleased, that, you, that we please you, that we are obedient, and that we glorify you with our lives as best we can, and we allow you to use us and our lives to be glorified in them. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' holy name. We hope you have enjoyed today's worship service brought to you live from the Pillar of Fire Church in Marion, Illinois. Please join us again next week at 2 p.m. Central Time for our next service. If you have a prayer request, we would be happy to pray for you. Please send your prayer request to prayer at godswarroom.com. All one word, prayer at godswarroom.com. Check out our website at www.godswarroom.com and have a blessed day.